All right, take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 118, Psalm 118. Today we are taking this entire day to reflect and remember on the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, just in case you weren't here during the Sunday school hour, we had Dr. Martha Boland came in and shared with us a little bit about the beginning of the Reformation. We trace that back to October 31st, 1517. It was on that day that Martin Luther went to the church door at Wittenberg. The church door was kind of like the Facebook of Wittenberg, if you might want to think about it. It was the place where you would post up information. Basically, it was a conversation between uh, faculty and class uh, uh, and students at the university there at Wittenberg. And he was posting up a document. He just simply wanted to engage in a debate over some of the abuses that were happening within the medieval Catholic Church. The main thing that had concerned him was there was a man named Johann Tetzel had shown up in around the area of Wittenberg, and he was selling what's called an indulgence, uh, basically a way for you to be able to purchase time for our one of your dead relatives out of purgatory. And Tetzel was sort of a natural showman. He was a, a born salesman. He would produce a elaborate uh, kind of programs, and he had a lot of uh, very, very fancy sayings. In fact, Luther in his 95 Theses even mentions one of those. Uh, the thing that, Lu that Tetzel was fond of saying is, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. And he would, he would prey on people who were brokenhearted over the loss of a loved one of getting them to raise money. Now, what Luther did not know, and was that there was a, actually a pretty big um, uh, involvement about, among church leaders in this. Um, there was a man named Albert of Mainz, and the reason that he was selling the indulgences and that reason was Albert had bought his archbishop position from the church and needed to pay it off. He'd borrowed money from the Fugger Bank, and so in order to pay it off, he uh, got permission from the Pope to sell these indulgences. Half the money would go to pay off Albert's debt. Half the money would go to pay off the debt that the church had incurred in building St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And so as he's out there selling it, Luther becomes very enraged by this and decides, let's have a discussion. Let's get the faculty together and, and let's begin to talk about it. What Luther did not know was that uh, while he was inviting people uh, with his, uh, um, uh, paper, or with his, with his uh, document to a debate, he was actually starting a reformation. He was actually uh, joining a long line of people who had come before him who were calling for the church to return, for, to return to Scripture and return to the pure preaching of the gospel. And uh, this becomes a powder keg moment. What's interesting about it is a lot of the things that Luther put in those 95 theses, later on, he would change that a little bit. He's still thinking through his theology. But there's some very important seeds in that document. A couple of them are, number one, that the Bible is the authority for the church. If you would ask most medieval evil people what they believe, they would say that the Bible and the church were of equal authority, that the church gave us the Bible. Luther makes it very clear that we, we come to faith in Christ because of the Word of God. And so the Bible is the sole authority for the church. And he marks that argument, or at least lays the seeds for it in those 95 theses. The other thing he says is that the very nature of indulgences are unbiblical. You can't purchase forgiveness. You can't purchase your way to heaven. Rather, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so he makes this very radical statement that launches what we know as the Reformation. And as you know, it didn't go very well. <laughs> uh, the church did not respond at all with a great deal of kindness over to this Weird little Augustinian monk coming out and saying, hey, I think the whole church is wrong. Basically, it's one guy standing against, uh, 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 the, well, on that day, the most powerful institution on the face of the earth. And so he goes through a series of debates between 1517 and 1521, but then he's in summons to the imperial dead of worms, and he is called to give an account. And I love what he does. They say there, listen, you must repent. He knows what they're going to do. If he doesn't repent, they're going to kill him, or recant, rather. They're going to kill him. 
But Luther makes that famous statement. He says, since your most sincere majesty and your highest mightiest require me a simple, clear, and direct answer, I will give you one. And it is this. I cannot submit my faith either to the pope or to the council because it is as clear as noonday that they have fallen into error and even into glaring inconsistency with themselves. If them I am not convicted by proof from the Holy Scripture or by cogent reasons, if I am not satisfied by the very text I have cited and if my judgment is not in this way brought into subjection to God's word, I neither can nor will retract anything, for I cannot be either safe or honest for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand, I can do no other, God help me, amen. He was immediately taken into custody, and as you know, he was stolen away, and uh, for the next several years of his life, forced to live in basic exile. He was taken to Vortburg Castle, later to, later to Coburg Castle, and he spent from 15, uh, 20, or 1517 to about 1530-something there in, uh, in basically locked away. But he didn't waste that time. One of the things that Luther did was translate the Bible from the Greek into German. Now, you have to understand something. There had been 22 different translations of the Bible in German uh, prior to Luther. But almost all of them, in fact, all, all but one that I could find was translated from the Latin version. Now, here's the problem with that. The Latin version of the Bible had some problems. I'm going to show you one of them here a little bit later in this message that actually relates to the text I'm going to preach from. During that time, Luther begins to write some commentaries. One of them was on the Psalms. And he says that Psalm 118 was his favorite psalm. Here's what he says about this psalm. He says, this is my psalm, my chosen psalm. I love them all. I love all Holy Scripture, which is my consolation in my life. But this psalm is nearest my heart. And I have a peculiar right to call it mine. It has saved me from many a pressing danger from which no emperor nor king nor sages nor saints could have saved me. It is my friend, dearer to me than all the honors and powers of this earth. And he reflected right here in this psalm. And so what I want to do here today, in fact, Luther took one of the verses from this psalm and had it turned into a plaque and hung on his wall. So in those times when he would get depressed, on those times when he would get discouraged, he would look up and he would read Psalm 118, verse 17, which says, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. And we find encouragement. So what I want to do today is read through this psalm. Then I want to take and just preach it. I just want to share with you what this psalm means, and we'll relate it to Luther's life and to your life here in just a couple moments. Let's begin in verse 1. I'm going to encourage you to do something. We're going to put it up on the screen, but I'm going to encourage you to do something. Look it up in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles in the pews somewhere there. Grab one and look at it because you really want to have the text of the Word of God right in front of you while we walk through this passage. I'm all for this, but I'm, I'm telling you, you really need to have it right in front. If you've got a tablet or if you've got a, uh, 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 a, a, a phone, look it up and read this as we go along and be there so you can refer to it when I walk you through it. Look what he says. He says, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hated me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees, and they went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not left me over to death. 
Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our sight. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in this. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The psalm can be broken down into really four different sections here. The the first section we find is in the first four verses there where the psalmist praises God and and shows gratitude for God's goodness. You'll notice there in that very first verse, the psalmist is actually commanding the congregation of Israel to praise God and give thanks for his goodness. You see that in verse 1? Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. When I used to pastor up in West Virginia, uh, I don't know why, I don't know where we remember we picked it up, but every once in a while, our worship leader would say, God is good, and the whole congregation would shout back all the time. And then he would say, and all the time, and they would say, God is good. He's reminding us here of the goodness of God. There's a couple of things I want you to notice about that. First of all, that this praise is directed to, go, to God alone. The psalmist here is writing to commemorate a great victory in the life of his of the nation. Now, we really don't know exactly what that event was. Uh, he doesn't tell us exactly what the historical event was that caused this great outpouring of praise. Uh, Charles Spurgeon imagined that the psalm refers to David or one of the other notable figures in Israel's history going up to the temple after a great victory. And he's commanding that uh, nation to praise God when we experience victory, when we experience the blessings of God, then what we must do is thank God alone. I want to make something very clear. We're going to talk a lot about Martin Luther throughout this day. The greater aspect is not Luther, but what God did through Luther. I want you to hear this. There are no heroes of the faith. God's the only hero. But God uses individuals And he uses people. And here, David is reminding them, the praise doesn't belong to me, or whoever wrote the psalms, reminding them, the victory doesn't belong to me, but it belongs to God. And so he commands them, praise God, for he is good. The goodness of God refers to several things. Number one, it reminds us that everything that God does is good. Amen? Everything that God does is ultimately good. Over in the book of Genesis, we see that. You remember when God is creating the heavens and the earth? At every stage of that creation story, God creates the light. He creates the earth. He creates the stars. He creates each thing in order. And at every stage, do you remember what he does? He says, and God saw that it was good. There's a reason for that. Everything that God does is good. In fact, when he created man and woman at the end of that, remember what he did? He looked at his creation and he said, now it's very good. He's reminding us there that we are the pinnacle of God's creation. The way he created the entire universe was to place you and me on this earth for his purpose and his plan. The things that God does is good. Not only that, but the Bible also tells us that God is the source of all good. James 1.17 says that every good and perfect gift ultimately comes from God. Romans 8.28, one of my favorite verses, all things work together together for good to those who love the Lord. That's a great statement. It's reminding us that whatever we go through in life, now that doesn't mean that all of the events of life are pleasant. Have you ever had an unpleasant circumstance in your life? 
Well, if you haven't, you're going to have them, I promise you. There will be moments when you're sick. There will be moments when you are, uh, are uh, struggling financially. There will be moments in your life where you're struggling emotionally. There will be moments when the circumstances of life are difficult. But here's what that verse reminds us. That in all of those things, God is in control, and he uses even that which we would feel was bad ultimately for good. He does that all through the Bible. Just go home. When you go home today, read the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis, and you will see that what his brothers intended for evil, God intended for good. That's what Joseph said. Joseph had been sold into slavery and had all kinds of problems, and yet he reminds us that even in that, God was still good. Everything does is is good. God is the source of all good. And listen to what the Bible says. We're also called to imitate God's goodness. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. When we demonstrate Christian love, when we demonstrate Christian compassion, we are reflecting the glory of God. So the psalmist starts and he says, Oh, give thanks, for God is good. But then he centers in. He wants to focus on one particular aspect of God's goodness. Notice what he does. In fact, Four times in this psalm, he's going to come back to this idea. Look what he says in verse uh, 1. He says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. If you have your Bible, underline that word, steadfast love. Notice, he's going to repeat it over and over again in verses 2 and 3 and 4. He says, let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say that his steadfast love endures forever. And then for good measure, clear at the end of the psalm, all the way at the end in verse 29, he comes back and he says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Now, let me tell you what happens. Anytime you see a word repeated in scripture, it means the writer is calling your attention to that word. They didn't have underline. They didn't have bold print. They didn't have emojis back then. They, all they had w- w- was, was repetition. And so when you find a word that's repeated, you know that's a key word in the text. And this particular aspect of God's goodness that he wants to focus in is on his steadfast love. I love that word. The word uh, in Hebrew is the word, and I'm going to butcher this because I can't make those guttural Hebrew sounds very good without spitting all over the first row. But, but the, the Greek word, is, or the Hebrew word is hased. Hased. And here's what it means. It refers to um, uh, God's unexpected kindness. So, for instance, in the book of Ruth, when, when Boaz shows an unexpected kindness to Ruth, that's the same word. Over and over again, the Bible shows us that God shows unexpected kindness to us. We could, we could think of that in terms of, of mercy. The English translation picks that up and emphasizes something very important. It is steadfast love. What it means is that it captures the idea that God's love does not give up. It doesn't throw in the towel. It keeps on pursuing our highest goal even in spite of ourselves. In other words, God keeps loving us and God keeps working on us. Have you ever noticed if you read the Old Testament that sometimes God's people were kind of unlovely? They were kind of people that was kind of difficult to love sometimes. I mean, every time God gives them these incredible blessings, they turn around and do terrible, bad things. And by the way, that's a record of God's people throughout history. You and I do that, do we not? We receive God's immense love, his mercy, his grace, and yet sometimes we don't really reflect his character. Sometimes we are kind of unlovely in the way we act. Luther As much as I respect and love his theology and so many of the things that Luther stood for, I'll be the first to tell you he was a flawed human being. In some of his writings, he writes things that are cringeworthy. He takes a few stands that I would absolutely do. He's not the hero. He's a recipient of God's steadfast. 
steadfast love. The psalmist repeats it four different times, three times right there in verses uh, th- two through four, and he keeps using this repetition. And he first talks about Israel, then the house of Aaron, and then all who fear the Lord. And commentators have kind of differed on, on exactly why he does that. But, but I think the best solution is, is that Israel, in verse two, is he's calling for all of God's people, all of the people of God, to praise and declare God's steadfast love. Then he focuses in on the house of Aaron, that's the priest. He says those who have been specially called to serve God, let them praise him. But then he backs up and he says, let all who fear the Lord. Well, in the Old Testament, God-fearers were Gentiles who had come into the faith. He's inviting anyone, even outside the nation of Israel, anyone who will fear God and love God to come in and to acknowledge his steadfast love. So he begins here with saying, thank you, God, for your love. And by the way, the greatest demonstration of God's love the greatest demonstration was in John 3.16 where the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God's greatest display of love was in sending his Son Jesus to die for us, to pay for the penalty for our sin, and to save us. But then the psalmist begins to move. In verses 5 through verse 9, he moves away from thinking about God's steadfast love and his gratitude, and he begins to think a little bit about God's providence. Now, God's providence means how God manages the universe, how God is in control of everything that happens. You notice what he says there. He says, out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me Free. He's, he's reflecting here on how God has shown his steadfast love in the psalmist deliverance. He says, there was a time when I was going through trouble. Verse 5, he says, out of my distress. That word distress literally means to be backed into a narrow corner. I couldn't help but to think of the movie Dirty Dancing. Nobody puts baby in a corner. <laughs> You know, nobody, put, I can't believe I, I even uttered that word on Reformation Sunday, but that's what it means. It means to be backed in to a tight and confining spot. Has there ever been a time in your life that you've experienced a, what I might call emotional claustrophobia? When it feels like the whole world is caving in on you. I, I found something in my own life, and, and I think you probably understand it. I know that David understood this. Sometimes the problems in life come in waves, one right after the other. Bang, bang, bang. I remember many years ago, Grace and I, Matt was really, really small at the time. We were taking a vacation down in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And we got there, and we, we, we really were kind of stupid. We didn't look at the weather report before we got down there and found out a hurricane was moving up. It looked like it was going to go more towards Florida. We thought we would be fine. We went to uh, uh, South Carolina. Anyways, next thing you know, a day and a half after we get there, they're saying that we're going to have to evacuate. The night we got there, we went down to the beach. Now, I know this is going to, I don't want to gross you out with this image, and I don't want to impress you too much with this image, but there was a time when I could boogie board. But I could boogie board like the best of them. All right, and I, and I decided I'm going to get out there and I'm going to boogie board. And because the, the, there were a lot of big waves, and I thought this could be great. We're going to have a lot of fun. And so I got out there with this dude who was about three times as large as me, and, and I didn't even know him. But but we just become we both kind of look like beach whales. I thought this looks great. We're going to we team up and we start and. and As the afternoon went on, the waves kept getting bigger and bigger. And then suddenly, I discovered something. We had gone way out, and I had gotten washed in, and I hit into this sandbar. And here's what happened. For about the next 10 minutes, one wave after another, boom, I would stand up. Boom. I could not get off this sandbar. Every time I stood up, another wave would hit. That's how life hits you. Sometimes life feels like it's just caving in and closing on you. That's the description the psalmist is saying. He says, it feels like all of life in my distress, I'm backed into a corner. I'm backed into this tight space. But notice what he says. He says, 
out of my distress I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. The word set me free there means literally he put me in a large space. He brought me out of that tight, confining, emotional claustrophobia, and he gave me release. He gave me freedom. He gave me a spot to stand in. Um, he, he even describes this situation even more vividly a little later. Notice what he says. Um, he says, I don't, he says uh, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do to me. The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph. But if you go down to no, verse number 12, Actually, in verse 10, he says, all the nations surrounded me. He's talking about, I feel like I'm surrounded by my enemies. They're pressing in. But then in verse 12, he said, they surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among the thorns. Have you ever walked in to a hornet's nest? When I was kids, me and my buddy Motown and my good friend Georgie, we all went down in the woods with our BB guns, and we were walking around the woods, and we were shooting at things. We were playing cowboys and Indians. We'd be cowboys and Indians for a little while. Then we'd be fighting the Nazis for a little while, and then we'd fight. You know, we'd just play an army down there in the woods. And Georgie looked up, and he said, look at that. Over there on the other side, we were up in the hills, and, and there's this big valley that went down between us with a little stream running down through there. On the other side, there was a hornet's nest in a, in a tree. Georgie says, Hey, man, let's shoot that hornet's nest. Yeah, we're a long ways away. Dumb old hornets will never know what hit them. Three of us, bing, 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 we shot. I loaded up my BB gun. You could put like seven or eight. If you just kept doing this, you could put, you'd put your finger on the end of the barrel, and you could just keep putting barrel, and it made like a shotgun. Y'all talk, know what I'm talking about? You kids don't even know. Our parents let us play with lead balls shot at 1,200 feet per second. Bang, and knock you out when they hit you, all right? You guys play with rubber balls, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, we're over there. We got, I got it loaded up. I got about 12 BBs I put. You know, they say on that, this Daisy tells you 10 pumps. <laughs> you can put 20 pumps in that thing. Boom, boom, I'm holding it. I'm cranking that thing down. I put as much in that thing hit, and it looked like the Doug Gum, uh, what was that, sh- uh, the Hunger Games. Sarah, it looked just like the Hunger Boom! Look at that, dude. All the hornets came out. I didn't know this. Hornets will find you. All right? They came rushing back. I did not know this. They can follow the disturbance in the air right back to the source. And I'm telling you what, we looked hor- We got back home, every one of us covered in welts. That's the description the psalmist is using. He says, it's like I walked into a swarm of bees and everywhere. They're just swarming about me, stinging me. I'll be honest with you. I think that's probably how Luther felt many times. Luther had discovered the Bible. For the first time in his life, he's reading the Bible and he's understanding it. And God is changing his life. For a couple of years prior to that, he'd been lecturing on some of the greatest verses in all of the Bible. And it was transforming his life. And he thought, you know what? Surely, if I just take the right stand, I'm going to stand for the Bible, not doing anything wrong. Surely, the leaders of the church will be on my side. When Albert hears about what's being done is his name, surely he will feel bad about it. The Pope, when he hears about what's happening over, he's probably unaware. When I tell him, of course, he's going to stand for the Scripture. What Luther did not understand was he was shooting a BB at a hornet's nest. And it erupted faster than he could ever imagine. And one by one, for the next several years, he's been called between one courtroom and another courtroom, questioned by the church, forced to give an answer. And here's what happened. The more they questioned, the deeper his resolve grew to, I'm going to stand for what the Word of God says, regardless of who's against me. That's a passage that I think he related directly to himself. There are moments in our lives 
where we're going to feel the same. Now, it may not be because we posted a doc, you know. If I walk in here tomorrow morning and there's 57, you know, different 95 theses, Pastor, I think you need to dress better, get a different haircut, you know, then I'm going to lose it. But I think Luther had no idea what he was going to start. There are moments in our lives where we get into a mess, where we get into a challenge, when we kick over the can and we find out there's a rattlesnake in there and we're in danger. And he's reminding us that I called out to God and in the midst of that he delivered me. Verses 10 through 18 become basically his statement of faith. I love verse 17. So did Luther. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. That verse was so important. He had to put it on a plaque and hung in his office. So every day he could look up and in the midst of the crisis say, God is going to maintain me. God is going to providentially care for me. I will not die until I am God, until God is finished with me. I had a good friend of mine named Burl Boswell. Burl was a missionary for many, many years in Peru and, and, and went all through the Amazon. And, 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 and many, many times his life was in absolute danger. Burl took the gospel to a, a cousin tribe of the tribes that had killed uh, Jim Elliott and all of the folks that you know the story of Jim Elliott. And, and he took the gospel to a cousin tribe. There was a time when he was tied up and held captive and and they were talking about killing him and and, and this tribe that he'd been trying to preach the gospel to was going to take his life. And I said, Burl, what's that like? And he said, I knew, I knew that they could not kill me until God was done with me. So I knew I was either going to heaven that day or God would intervene and rescue me somehow. I'm going to say, this is what Burl used to say. Burl would say, I am bulletproof till God is finished with me. Where did he get that idea? He took it right from this psalm. This was Luther's favorite psalm. This was Burl Boswell's favorite psalm. This should be your favorite psalm. No matter what you're doing, no matter how much opposition, know that God will sustain and keep your life. Our strength, our protection, our deliverance does not come from human sources. We often talk a great deal about how Luther was very fortunate to have Frederick the Wise who, who kind of stole him away and hid him in Wartburg Castle and protected him. And we think about how wonderful it was that, that Luther had the largest army in Europe at the time kind of backing in. And sometimes we give credit to human sources for something that God was doing. I'm going to say this to you. It wasn't Frederick the Wise that protected Luther. It was God who protected Luther, ultimately. It's not human instruments that protect you. It's God. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we get sick. We have a health problem, and we get done. We, we're, oh, the doctor saved me. I love Dr. Oliver, and I'm going to use him as an illustration. Doc, and be, by the way, Doc will be the first to tell you this. Dr. Oliver is an incredible doctor. All right? He tells me I'm fat all the time, but I forgive him for that. All right? He's a wonderful, wonderful doctor. But he's never saved anybody. God saves people. God sustains their life. And he'd be the first to tell you that. The the knowledge and the skills that God has given to him are to be used for his glory. That's what that verse reminds us of. God is our protector. He is our salvation. That is Luther's personal uh, statement of faith. And, man, I got so far off my notes, I have to go down here. That's why, by the way, Luther says this about this psalm. This is my personal psalm. In the moments of his life when he thought he was going to die, he could look to this. And then finally, in verses 19 to the uh, end, the psalmist turns to prayer. He begins uh, the the, the psalm uh, by a reflection on the gratitude and the goodness of God, and then he begins to remind us of the doctrine of God's providence and giving us his own personal story of how God had delivered him. But then it turns to prayer. I often say this about David. David often preached himself out of distress and out of despair. There are moments in David's life when he was very down and he was very discouraged, but 
often he'll reflect on the things of God and he preaches his way right out of it. This is a good example of that. At the end of the passage here, in verse 19, look what he says. He, look how he's praying. He says, open to me the gates of righteousness. Now, it may have been that this is a, a moment when the worshipers have arrived at the temple and they're literally saying to the people inside the temple, open to me the gates of righteousness. But it has an even greater meaning. It's reminding us that the doors to salvation are open. We don't have to earn them. We don't have to go and buy indulgences. We don't have to go pay for it or work for it. Jesus has secured our salvation through his death on the cross. And so he says, open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the God. The concept of righteousness was an important doctrine and idea throughout the Reformation. The medieval church taught that the righteousness of God was basically tantamount to his anger. God was a very, very angry God in the medieval Catholic church. And and they had very little concept that uh, God was going to give you his righteousness. You had to earn his righteousness. You had to earn your way into heaven, and you did that by a number of things. Unless you believe that anything has changed, I promise it has not. It's the same doctrine. The same Lateran church steps that Luther climbed up are still in Rome. They built a side uh, set of steps that are an exact replica to handle the thousands of people that are gathered there even this day and every day of the year trying to earn their way into heaven. Luther, that's his concept of righteousness prior to looking at the Bible. But the more he reads the Bible, the more he understands that God's righteousness is a gift. It didn't start that way. When he's walking home that day from school and lightning strikes near him and he thinks he's going to die and he cries out to St. Anne and he joins the Augustinian monastery, Luther is doing that to try to earn his salvation. But while he's in the monastery, he begins to read the Bible and he recognizes that the righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It is a righteousness that, the way the Reformers will say it later on, is an alien righteousness. It's not righteousness that we have within us, but rather it is something that God grants us through the death of Christ on the cross and through our faith. The more he read, the more he understood that you simply attain this righteousness by trusting in Jesus Christ. This is where that study of the Bible becomes so important to Luther. In Luther's day, the only Bible available widely were the Latin translations of the Bible, the Latin Vulgate. And as he read that, in fact, the entire medieval church in many senses is built on the mistranslation of one word. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Just flip over there real quick. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Let me show you a very important verse. And this verse, by the way, pops up. This idea pops up in other passages, but we're just going to look at one. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 for just a moment. This is a summary of the message that Jesus preached. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, rather, is at hand. You see that one word, repent, right there? In the Latin translation of the Bible, they took that little Greek word, metanoia, and they took that word and translated it as penance. Do penance for the kingdom of God is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do penance is very different. Do penance means you have to do righteous acts, good things, in order to earn your way into heaven. That's what penance means. But that's not what the word metanoia means. 
Luther understood that because now he has this new Greek translation of the Bible available to him. And when he opens Erasmus' Greek and reads the original language and he looks at that word and he compares it in his Latin translation, he realizes it says something exactly opposite. It does not say do penance. It says repent. The word repent means turn around. You're going one direction, turn around. We talked about that the other night at Judgment House. Repent. You're going one direction. You turn around. You go the other direction. And you begin to follow Jesus Christ. And as a result of repentance and placing your trust in Christ, you are saved. And when Luther recognized that and he has that moment he talks about the gates of heaven opened up to me. He's drawing right from that text in Psalms 118. He's recognizing that God is his salvation. He discovered this new righteousness of God. And he also sees something else in verse 22 of Psalm 118. He recognizes that this is pointing him to Jesus. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now, in, Luther, in, in, in David's day when he wrote that psalm, many scholars believe there had actually been outside of the temple in Jerusalem a stone that had been rejected. It was a stone that when they were building the temple, something was wrong with it, something was marred on it, and they left it outside, and it was still there. And when they would walk by, that was the stone that the builders rejected. But Jesus picks up that note later on. He picks up in that same verse over in Matthew chapter 21, verse 24, and he reminds us that he is the stone that the builders rejected. That a whole Christian faith rests on who Jesus is. And, and the Jews of Jesus' day rejected that. They didn't recognize that he was their Messiah. But as Luther is reading that and he's comparing the rest of Scripture, he recognizes that this is pointing me to Jesus. And his entire frame of reference changes. He's no longer trusting in himself. He's no longer trusting in the church. He's trusting in Jesus alone for his salvation and his life radically changes. And you say, Pastor, why in the world are we talking about him 500 years later? We're really not talking about him so much as we're talking about the gospel that he rediscovered. Oh, there were others. Don't get me wrong. God has always had believers in every age. Make no mistake. There were others in the medieval church in that medieval period who believed the same thing. A few years before that, about 100 years before that, there was a man named Jan Hus. Jan Hus was a Bohemian. Some of you went to Prague on a mission trip a few years ago, and you got to see a statue of Jan Hus. Hus was a Bohemian. He came to that same exact understanding of salvation, and he began to preach it, and he began to teach it, and when the church found out about it, they burned him at the stake, and they buried him. The priest or the bishop that oversaw the execution of Jan Hus was buried in the church in Erfurt, underneath the altar. They did that a lot back then. They would bury a famous bishop underneath the... And when they would ordain new bishops or new priests, they would have the priest lay down on top of of that relics of those bones of those famous bishops of the time past. Luther, when he was ordained, was ordained in the church of Erfurt, literally laying face to face with the bones of the man who burned Jan Hus. Later on, when Luther was at his trial and Lipsig, I believe. They pulled out some of Hus's books and they said, Luther, you are a Husite. You're teaching the same things that the heretic Hus taught. And we killed Hus. And Luther says, I really don't know who you're talking about. 
And they said, here's his books, read them. And he read them and he came back and he said, absolutely, I believe just what Hus said. We're all Husites, he said, if you believe. But Hus had gotten his ideas from a guy named Wycliffe who was an Englishman who in the 14th century translated a Bible into English for the very first time. And he had come to many of these. See, what I'm trying to show to you is that God in every age has his people. And while we celebrate how he worked in Luther's life, it's not because Luther's the hero. It's because God is the hero. And his gospel never, ever, ever, ever fails. Amen? We could stake our life on it. It is the basis. Luther, for the rest of his life, committed to preaching that gospel. That gospel tore across Europe. It changed all of Europe. It, it spread to England. And the king of England, by the way, he had it all messed up. The king of England didn't want to reform the church. He just wanted to marry a different woman. He didn't like Catherine of Aragon because she shouldn't get, couldn't give him a baby. So he says, I want, to, I want to divorce her. I want a male child. And he marries Anne Boleyn in order to do that. He has to be divorced from his wife so the Pope won't do it because, by the way, he was related to her. So he's not going to allow that to happen. And so they break away. But then there was this group called the Puritans who started raising up within that English church and saying, we've got to come back to the Bible. Look what the Bible says. And some of those people broke off and said, we, we don't need a state church like we used to have anymore. They become the pilgrims, and the first people to come to America were the pilgrims. Actually, there was some Spanish here before that, but we're going to just start with the pilgrims. Why am I telling you this? We're here today because of this incredible movement of God. The church in America needs reformed just as desperately as the church did in the Middle Ages. Today, we need to come back to a firm understanding of the gospel. Today, maybe you're here today, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. i got great news for you. You can have a personal reformation, a personal transformation that can happen in your life as a result of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that gospel that changed Luther can change you. Amen? Tammy, and a beautiful display of that, pictured that display today in baptism. I don't even know if she understood this, but you preach the gospel today. And that baptism, which is a symbol of our salvation, we symbolize that on that night when Tammy was repented of her sins and she trusted in Jesus Christ, the old Tammy was d- died spiritually and was buried and been rose again to walk in a brand new life. Guess what? That can happen to anyone. That can have, that's the legacy of the Reformation. So today, if you've never come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, on this day when we stop to think about this great move in history, let your history, your walk with Jesus start here. Amen? Come to know him today. Come. The altar is open here in just a few moments. The invitation will be given. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you come, you grab me by the hand and say, Pastor, today I need to to give my life to Christ. We have people who will take you aside and sit down and share with you more fully the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to join the church. You say, Pastor, I need to be a part of a church that's preaching the gospel. I got good news for you. We're preaching the gospel not only here in Matron, but literally around the world. Come, be a member of the church. Maybe you're here today and say, Pastor, I've drifted away. I've literally not been living for him. I need to rededicate today. The altar is open. You come as we sing our hymn of invitation. Stand with me. I'm going to pray, and we're going to sing, and you come. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for this day that we can set aside to remember what you did in the life of your church and the way you constantly sustain us and keep us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.